Hello, my name is Anthony Edwards. I live in Silverton. Um, I'm going to talk about the San Juans and the reshaping of Circle and Hard Rock Mining. And it's basically a legal aid update by Gold King and the Benita Peak and the cases that are involved here. Um, I, I want to start with if you think of if you think of um, an x-axis and you're going across and that's science and technology and we're moving forward and then you take the y-axis and go up and down and think about money and resources to figure out our problems and then you intersect it you know on the z with um, with the law and policy you realize how complex answering these the, a lot of these issues that we're talking about are and, and, and you have a pull on each of those as the money goes down obviously there's not the resources necessarily to do some of the things we want and if science or technology slow down but i don't think that's what's going on right now i think we have um a legal system that is actually um maybe needs to be re-looked at and i think there's been some discussions today uh talking about different uh, options good sam but just think about that as we go forward I, we are in a very complex system. This is where science and law intersect and, and it really becomes, I, I'm not sure what's going on there and I'm not sure what's going on where science and technology and, and the law are intersecting here where we are today. But simple can be harder than complex. You have to work hard to get your thing to clean and make it simple, but it's worth it in the end because once you get there, you can move them out. There's a lot of intelligent people here. They understand different concepts, some better than the other. And, and I, I hope that we go away um, today thinking just about all these different ways and hoping that we can figure out ways through uh, the impediments for us moving forward. With that, I'm going to start talking about the law. Try to stay away. <laughs> all right, so I, I'm going to be, I, just to, in full disclosure, I, I'm corporate counsel and trial attorney. I currently serve as counsel for the Gold Key Mines Corporation and Winter Park Helicopter and some other mining uh, organizations. I've worked in the past in New Mexico for the Environment Department, so I am familiar with this uh, subject matter. Um, the limitations, the issues and information I'm going to present have been tailored for the conference, and therefore they're not all inclusive. So the attorneys out there, I, you can hammer me later, but I, this is not a CLD. Um, and then, um, so we're going to go through uh, the different cases and some of the concepts that are going on. The Gold King, Mindsville, are three of the cases, the New Mexico versus Colorado, the New Mexico versus the EPA, uh, the Navajo versus the EPA, and it all, on both of those cases, that's the mining companies, essentially, uh, the primary ones. And then we're going to go to the Superfund designation, Sunnyside Gold versus the EPA. Uh, so we're going to go to D.C., come, go, come back down to New Mexico, and then go back to D.C., and we'll finish with federal tort claims, and then go on up. Um, so the Gold King spill, that was in New Mexico versus Colorado, that's in the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, they, they, there's three primary issues that I want to point out today, whether Colorado is liable under circle and common law for the expenses incurred and incurred in New Mexico in responding to these releases, the threat releases of hazardous substances, and from the Gold King mine and the Sunnyside mine or the American Tunnel, all in the same area, I think we, everybody's aware of that. Um, so, will, will Colorado be liable? And where does this really, what does this stem from? It stems from uh, Colorado managing its resources and, and um, its environmental management scheme. And so, are, are we not doing it correctly? And if not, um, and how, what, are we, what would we have to do to get it correct? And how long would that take? Um, I, I just, that's a rhetorical question. Uh, whether Colorado is in violation of the resource Conservation Recovery Act's imminent and substantial endangerment provision until it ceases the disposal of hazardous substances from the Gold King Mine and the Sunnyside Mine. Clean but not limited to the acid uh, wastewater mine, sludge, uh, mine dump runoff, etc. until it ceases disposal. So are, is the mining estate in Colorado going to have to be fixed before uh, we stop incurring damages as a state? Um, and how, what are those damages going to be? And then whether Colorado negligently and recklessly and willfully authorized and allows discharge of toxic mine waste directly into the animus rivers in a manner that is injured and continues to threaten the health, safety, and comfort of downstream New Mexico residents. What's so interesting about this case in the Supreme Court is that New Mexico also is upstream from a lot of other states. And so if they're successful here, I'm not sure if they really thought about what that means to them. Put that out there. 
I just um, uh, and, and if they're successful, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a prediction that LA is gonna be so happy because they're gonna have all the water in there. Um, the current status: the acting solicitor general was invited to file a brief in the case, expressing the views of the United States that it was from the Supreme Court. They haven't done so. I'm not sure if you could do that in the time frame they were provided. I think you could spend seven years trying to figure out how you want to answer or weigh in on this issue. And the state of Colorado has responded. The exclusive jurisdiction provisions of CERCLA and RIPRA include state versus state. Um, New Mexico's CERCLA claims do not establish that Colorado is a covered person for purposes of CERCLA liability, and New Mexico's RIPRA claims are expressly barred in CERCLA and RIPRA. So we don't know where this is going. Uh, all we know is that it has huge implications if it gets hurt. And, um, and what I said before, in New Mexico and, and the Navajo, if they're New Mexico and the Navajo Nation are successful, um, upstream, and, and this goes to the next case as well, upstream state sovereign immunity could be relinquished if, if their environmental management or lack thereof is found to contribute to the impairment of downstream state resources. Um, we could go on all day about that. But. So the next is, um, we're gonna go back to New Mexico. That's the federal courthouse downtown New Mexico, or Albuquerque, for those of you who've seen it. It's a very nice new building built in the last two decades. Um, uh, Pete Domenici, I think, is the name of the building. Um, uh, and so this is the New Mexico versus the EPA. And this is, um, uh, along with all the mining companies, or many mining companies, I should say, and then um, the Navajo versus the EPA, along with the same. Essentially, these cases have been consolidated. Um, there's been a complaint, and I don't know how many people are familiar with the litigation process, but um, usually within the first 50 or 60 documents, you also have an answer. Actually, it's usually within the first five. We're at 178 um, documents that have been filed now, and these cases, we haven't got to the answer of any of the defendants yet. Just to give you an idea. And it's been going on, I think, well, May uh, 23rd of last year. Um, I think we would probably get to the answer, which then you start discovery, probably in May of 2017, the way things are going, excuse me, 2018. And I think this is going to go over five years. It's not that right. But I'll eat crow later. <coughs> um, general issues, whether the EPA can be held accountable. So can the EPA be held accountable if there's an issue that comes or an in, in a, in a, um, event such as this? Whether EPA contractors can be held responsible for response actions. Now that, that's important um, because if EPA contractors can now be responsible if they're doing something under the order of the EPA, what do you think the cost? If they find that the, if the courts find that the EPA contractors can be held responsible for response actions, what is it, what are the bids and what are contractors going to cost now um, to be to work on these projects? So the, the, the project costs are going to go out, out, out of over the roof, right? So and then whether former owners can be held accountable for events transpiring subsequent to ownership. So um, if you sold your property ten years ago and there's some um, government work on your property during that time and something happens such as this, can you be held? I mean, that's a that's that's an extension of what we've had in the past on some level. And then, uh, and, and don't get me wrong, you're always liable long term if you've ever held a property that is is polluting. But we're talking about an event triggered by um, a, a agency action, okay? Um, and, and I understand that's debatable. Whether private entities owning properties adjacent to property of the Goki Mine can be held liable to damages incurred from the Gold King Mine spill. Not other damages, but from the spill. That would be the, what Sunnyside is having an issue with. So current status, defendants have separately, separately filed motions to dismiss. EPA um, uh, is um, claim, and they're, the, they're one of the defendants. Just sovereign immunity prevents plaintiff's claims against the EPA. The EPA is not an operator, transporter, or arranger. And the court lacks jurisdiction over the Navajo Nation's tort claims because the Federal Tort Claims Act's discretionary function exempts, uh, exception preserves sovereign immunity and such. So the current status also, um, I, and I think this is one of the, out of the 
documents in the docket, the EPA is investigating the commingled co release of metals in numerous mines and mine related activities in the animus. And in other words, the scope of the listing and the future potential remedy is as broad as the watershed. New Mexico is arguing that, that it can maintain its Clean Water Act claim as to unnamed mines not subject to the NPL listing thus fails. So the scope of the listing and the future potential remedy is as broad as the watershed. Well, we have the animus, right? Here we are up here. The Bonita Peak is essentially identified. That watershed goes there, here, and on. So I'm not, I'm not sure what, how broad this is going to go. I'm just saying that inside what they're putting inside the courts, those are the people not here on the ground, I don't believe, but that it's going to go as far as the, the watershed. And what does that mean? The current status of the other defendants, plan, um, this is the, the mining companies, essentially is that, uh, the plaintiffs lack personal jurisdiction over the defendants. Just to explain that real quick, it's, um, the primary claim is that they're from Colorado and that New Mexico cannot bring in Colorado companies into their courts if they didn't purposely direct um, anything towards New Mexico. And so that's the, that's the basis of that argument. Colorado is an indispensable party that can't be joined. Uh, the argument there is that Colorado has been involved in this through the DRMS and other agencies, CDPHE, and that to not let them into the, the court, um, that they, Colorado has sovereign immunity in the state courts here, and that if they are, are in federal courts at, at the state level, and so New Mexico can't bring them in, and neither can the defendant trying to make their defense. Therefore, they're a, a party who must be at the table. Um, find the circle of preempt state law, and I'll, I'll just go on from there. Bonita Peak um, Superfund site. This is the sunny side versus EPA. Um, this is um, in the U.S. Uh, Court of Appeals in Washington D.C. Uh, the um, the issue is that uh, the way that the um, the issue is, uh, according to Sunnyside, is that the EPA, um, when they they created the NPLS, they did so arbitrarily and capriciously, and that the hazard ranking system protocol was not applied to 27 sites included in the Superfund list. Those are over half the sites that are in the Superfund list, and that they that oh, those 27 sites were not scored. Why is Sunnyside taking this up? Well, Sunnyside. And by extension, Kinross, the sites um, were not scored in this in this um, uh, Superfund list. And so, in an effort to ensure that, the, so this is uh, the the Code of Federal Regulations, in an effort to ensure that potential NPL sites were reviewed in an objective manner, the EPA created the HRS. That's the Hazard Ranking System. And the purpose of the section is to identify the criteria as well as the methods and procedures. So the plaintiff, the sunny side, is uh, arguments are to address the concern associated with EPA not properly using the HRS. And this is 1986. Congress amended surplus with the um, with SARA, uh, the Superfund Amendment, um, the authorization. Congress' motivation to amend CERCLA was its dissatisfaction with the EPA's listing of a disproportionate number of high volume, low toxicity, hazardous waste sites, notably mining sites. So this is 1991. And the HRS process is relatively the objective. The data is collected and scored. An owner then has the opportunity to evaluate the findings and present objections. An owner does not have the opportunity when the property is not scored before the listing, before listing it on the NPL, resulting in the harmful effects of listing without the objective criteria to justify the harm. So EPA, so this is supporting for, again, study site. EPA simply attributed HRS scores to the scored sites of each and every non scored site, as well as other and yet unidentified mining and mining related activities across the entire DPMD. With me to keep my ears. EPA's decision to include the non scored sites within the uh, district listing must be set aside if it's arbitrary and capricious. That's the United States Code. And then there's general supporting arguments under the Fifth Amendment. Um, that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process, and the HRS process, while minimal at best, in conjunction with the opportunity to comment on those findings, 
is the extent of the process offered to private property owners during the NPL process. It goes on and on, okay? The current status is the EPA's response is due in August 2017. And I'll just talk about that in a second. The EPA, when they did the, did the different sites, they used a, con a concept called co-legal release. I mentioned it a little bit before, and the idea is that this site is by this site, and I don't, I don't want to go too far into the thinking, but what it appears is, and so they're similar in a similar area, and so collectively they're, they're creating. And so that's what's at stake, this commingled release idea, and what, and what that concept will mean. And I, and I think if, if um, uh, it's upheld on the commingled release, that we'll see CERCLA expanded uh, tremendously um, beyond just what the traditional uh, process is in sites inside of the EPA. Potential outcome, the non sports sites can be removed from the NPL. Um, we'll go to the Federal Tort Claims real quick. And um, in regards to the Federal Tort Claims, in January, the EPA claims sovereign immunity, immunity declaring that it's not mandated under federal law to repay $1.2 billion to the states. I think New Mexico came down on what they were claiming before, so I don't think that number is still at 1.2. That's the latest I had. Um, on the horizon, um, just so we're talking about the litigation going on right now, um, I'm going to roll. Um, uh, but we have not, um, the actions against potential responsible parties inside of the super fund has not even started. The litigation hasn't even started yet. This is I mean, the real litigation inside the traditional super fund. The other is that there's natural resources damages, um, and that's from uh, public entities who um, potentially um, have damages from historic waste, and those, those uh, cases haven't started yet, at least officially. I know they've been um, informed that they need to start uh, assessing that. And then two super fund facts. Um, litigation hold includes approximately 50,000 documents at this time. That's not pages, that's documents. And that's over 1.3 million pages. Um, the study site consent decree was ordered. Uh, I didn't talk a lot about it, but I think a lot of people that are familiar with this, there was a consent decree. Uh, was ordered by Colorado Supreme Court Justice, uh, Chief Justice Nancy Rice from originally serving as a Denver District Court Judge. Thank you. Sorry I'm going over. Questions for Anthony? Sure. sure. Ms. Padden? My question is, um, these backfire, we have, sorry, we have, both of them, we have, um, situations, we have, um, Yeah, so, so the question is, could this, um, lawsuit backfire on New Mexico, and I would say if Colorado loses, it will backfire on, I won't say backfire, but it will impact every state with the rain mine, particularly those in the West. And, and, their, and, and their environmental management schemes, their Department of Health, all of those things. Yes? I thought the Superfund label was not applied after the spill, am I wrong in that? The Superfund label was applied after the after spill. After the spill, so isn't this grandfathered in as a non-Superfund site? No. Legally? No. All, all of um, all of the um, all of the spaces, uh, American Tunnel, all of those areas that were indirectly um, have been attributed or alleged anyway as a part of, of the Gold King on some level. Are all a part of the super fund right now. Yes. Uh, have there been any other decisions handed down in that first case? Or is it oh, uh, uh, have there been any decisions uh, rendered on on any of these cases? Is, and no, there have not, and there won't be for quite a long while. And and there'll be a lot of waiting, um, particularly by those who empower back and. Uh, DC um, to move forward on a lot of different decisions we would like to be expedited until these are decided. That makes sense. Okay. 
So, from, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I can repeat that. <laughs> so, so, so um, when you say co-mingled release, does that, does the, the, the terminology of co-mingled release uh, continue to mean joint and several? Is that? So, as long as not one. Yes. And then, and and so what's been brought up is a, the concept of joint and several liability. And so joint and several liability means if you're all commingled together, um, and in a let's say a plume, you all are jointly and severally liable for the whole. Uh, and then and then you got to figure it out unless you can show that yours is only contributing a certain amount and attribute that to the damages. Are we are we on the same? Okay. Um, the commingled release in this is is not has not been tested to my best to the best of my knowledge. Okay, there's a lot of books out there and information, but to the best of my knowledge has not been that concept as commingled release of waters in, in a groundwater hydrology has not been tested in the courts as it relates to joint civil liability. Is that, is that any other questions? Sure, when. Think the background is part of that uh, Well, I would have to believe so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. I'll be around for a while.